I'm really happy with the look of the cable Damascus in this little axe. Too bad it's absolute trash. Today's video is sponsored by Blacksmith Supply. Good morning and welcome back to Black Bear Forge. If you recall last week's video, we took a piece of steel cable, cut it into sections, welded those sections up, brought all those together, and made a little billet of cable steel. This cable is supposed to be extra improved plow steel, which should be 1095, so it's good high carbon steel. So today I hope to cover the entire process of forging a little axe head. This axe will have a wrapped eye, meaning that we'll rough out the profile of the eye and flat fold it up, weld it together, and that'll form the eye. In many ways, it's a lot easier than punching, especially when working with welded up material like this. I'm going to hook that fuller over the edge of the anvil as I thin the material for the eye. I'm going to have to work back and forth between the near edge and the far edge, flipping it over so I get the eye spread out evenly. Try not to damage the shoulders you've just created. I'm going to let the forge run so I can keep this up at welding heat. This one's just slightly longer, so I'll thin this out a little bit more to make these match. Getting these to match before you wrap this really helps make for a symmetrical eye. I'm going to start spreading the cutting edge while this is flat. I think it's a little bit easier than waiting till after it's welded up. Plus, I've got something else I need to do that I don't want to weld all the way to the end of this after the first wrap here. Making sure those shoulders on the inside of the eye line up is the most important thing at this point. As always, fast light hammer blows are the key. This will take several heats as it starts to cool off, get it right back in the fire. Now, as I mentioned, I am not welding all the way to the cutting edge here. Now, the cable is high carbon steel. It's going to take a great cutting edge, wonderful for knives, and I don't really mind a knife edge that has all of these little cable strands right there next to the edge. But an axe is kind of abused, and all those cable strands are pointing right at the part that's going to take the most abuse, right at the cutting edge. There are hundreds, maybe even thousands of little cable strands, and if the weld isn't perfect, if any of those strands want to come apart, 
it's going to start to fail as you chop, split, whatever it is you're doing with it. And certainly if somebody's using this as a little throwing axe, it's going to be more vulnerable. So I'm going to take the same approach I would if this was all a mild steel or wrought iron axe at this point. And I'm going to prepare a piece of 1095 to be the cutting edge for this axe. And that way I've got something that isn't so vulnerable. It'll be cable right up to about the last half inch or so once this is ground. Should still be a striking look, but I think this will be a more reliable edge. I've thinned out the edge of the piece of 1095 so that it fits down into the cleft in the axe better. And I just want it to fit a little bit closer before I weld it up. It saves me the trouble of cleaning it up later. This just puts some teeth on it so it doesn't squirt out of the cleft when we go to make the first welding pass. I haven't used this axe holding jig since I got the new Fontanini anvil and the horn is definitely in the way so I'm going to have to reconfigure how this thing clamps up. Still useful though. While we wait for that to cool, I would like to thank today's video sponsor, Blacksmith Supply. Blacksmith Supply is an online retailer for just about everything you could possibly need in blacksmithing. Anything from the Smith & Magician guillotine tool, pre-made tongs, specifically the Tom Tongs, I think I mentioned a couple of videos ago. They have fly presses, they have some materials, they have hand tools, punches, chisels, hammers. Blacksmith Supply carries the Iron Mountain Flux that we've been using for part of this project. If you use the link in the video description and the coupon code BEAR5, you'll receive 5% off your next order. Some exclusions apply, specifically treadle hammers.
for the most part, I'm really happy with the way this axe is coming out. Unfortunately, it's a reject. Let me explain why. The forge welds have completely disappeared. You can't see the usual seam at the eye. You can't tell where the steel insert has been put in for the cutting edge. All of that came out really well. Super happy with the way that came out. And I like the profile that this little axe has. It's a nice lightweight little axe. It'd be an okay camping axe or for splitting kindling wood, something like that. But the fatal flaw in this axe is the eye. I got a little carried away forging the eye. Not only is the eye larger than I think this axe needs, but it's considerably thinner, especially right up in this spot right here. And I think that's just waiting for an excuse to break. It might last for years, and if it's not abused, it might be a perfectly good axe for the rest of my life anyways, but I would never sell this to a customer. And because of that, I'm not gonna bother to put my touch mark on it. I'm gonna go ahead and harden it, temper it, probably still gonna go ahead and put a handle on it just so we can see what it came out like. But maybe that means there'll be a part three to the Cable Axe series, and we'll try to make something that is more usable in the long run. My heat treat app says 1095 should be brought up to 1475, then quenched in water or brine. For some reason, I thought it was oil hardening, but I'm gonna go ahead and go with what they say. And we're just gonna harden the very end of this. I'm not gonna quench the whole thing. I'm gonna go ahead and heat this in the gas forge for hardening. 1475 is kind of a dull red, so I'm gonna turn the gas pressure way down, put it in there, bring it up to heat a little bit, turn it off, let it soak alternate back and forth, and it'll take about 10 minutes or so to bring this up to heat. I don't need to heat the whole thing, so I'm only going to heat the part we need to quench. A quick test as hardened with the Rockwell testing files shows this is between 55 and 60 Rockwell. That's a pretty good hardness for an axe. I'm gonna go ahead and temper it for an hour in the toaster oven at 450 and see what we get then. Well, after tempering and on closer examination, I see another fatal flaw in this little axe. And that is that the weld for the cutting edge failed in the quench. I don't remember seeing that previously, but, but at some point it split right up along that. And that means this axe is just absolute trash, completely useless at this point. Not even worth trying to save it. But I'm going to go ahead and polish up the good side, just so we can see what that pattern looks like on the Damascus axe. But we're going to keep making cable axes until we get one that works right, so there will at least be one more part in this series. Now failures like this are always disappointing, but sometimes it's just part of the reality in blacksmithing. Things don't always go the way you plan. Now why did this fail? Now somebody out there is thinking right off, well it failed because you quenched it in water. Well 1095 is supposed to be a water hardening steel. It also recommends brine, which is a much harsher quench than water. So really it should be able to survive a quench that harsh. Now it's possible the water that I used to quench was a little bit cold. I did preheat it some, but maybe I didn't get it warm enough, especially since it's still winter here in the shop. It's also possible I had it a little too hot when I went to quench. And that's one of the downsides to hardening and tempering by eye. Doing it in the electronic oven, you know you've got it at an exact temperature and you know that it's soaked thoroughly through so that it's even throughout the piece. It's certainly possible there was a flaw, flaw in the forge weld, but I think that would have shown up earlier if that had been the case. What I really think happened is just bad timing on my part. And what I mean by bad timing is you should temper immediately after quenching. I didn't do that. I decided, well, let's do some hardness testing. So I set this on the anvil. I moved cameras around to show what I was doing with the hardness files, went and got the hardness files, then moved cameras around so I could talk to you just like I'm doing now about what I had just done with the hardness files. And it was a good 15 or 20 minutes before this went into the tempering oven. That whole time, this steel is trying to pull itself apart because it's stressed to the maximum after quenching and it's doing everything in its power to find a way to break and relieve some of that stress, which ultimately it ended up doing. That crack wasn't there while I was doing the hardness testing. At least if it was, I didn't see it. Instead, I think that crack occurred in the tempering oven while it was coming up to temperature because it didn't get up to tempering temperature soon enough after being quenched. 
And I've had this happen to me before. I used to harden things here in the shop before we lived up here, didn't have power in the shop. So I took things home to put them in the kitchen oven. And more than once, sitting on the car seat next to me on the drive home, you could hear that little tink that said something just cracked. And that's just that stress finally finding a way to relieve itself. So it's really important to temper immediately after hardening. And I should have just gone ahead and done that, or I should have been better prepared to do that hardness test in about two minutes instead of taking 15 or 20 minutes to do all the nonsense that I did as part of that. Now, as far as the water issue goes, after reading a lot of the online forums, people say oil just simply is not a fast enough quench. To quench 1095, you won't get good results. But there is one oil out there that is closer to water, and it kind of bridges that gap between water and oil. And I'm going to try some of that. That's Parks 50. It's something special. It's different than all the other hardening oils, a lot faster quench. And it's supposed to be good for things like 1095 or W1, 1045, all those simple steels. It's also really expensive, but I ordered five gallons of it. It's going to be here sometime in the next week. And after I've got that, maybe I'll do some experiments. And we'll get back to looking at forging a cable axe when I think the chances of success are just a little bit higher. In the meantime, I do hope you enjoyed the video and that you've learned something from my failures. If you did, give the video a thumbs up. If you haven't done so already, I would love it if you hit that subscribe button. In the meantime, I hope you have time in your day to get out to your shop, make something, but stay safe, wear your safety glasses. We'll see you for the next video.